Greetings everybody, Many Carper here. Welcome to episode 34 of the Many Crop Grow Series. Like always, we are starting off in the pre-veg area. Just gonna take a quick look at the plants that are in here, all in one gallon pots. Been in one gallon pots for about two weeks now, maybe a little less than two weeks. The far side we, over there, we've got the big grown Girl Scout cookies cut with those green tags, orange tags down there. Those are all animal cookies. The middle section is all OGKB. Haven't touched any of these. Uh, I've done a tiny bit of, of lollipopping on them, that's all, just to get the foliage away from the dirt. The Bay Grown and Animal, just been pinching and topping selectively, but they're much taller than the OGKB. <coughs> on the far side here at the red tags, we have the Animal Crackers cut, and they're looking pretty good too. They're definitely not as vigorous as the Animal Cookies or the Bay Grown, but so far they're looking all right. Hopefully the genetics come around and these start to get better. I did throw away some of them. They were all planted, even the ones that didn't have roots. Some of them were really shitty. They got tossed out because I needed some one gallon pots to plant these clones here, which are clones that I took off of the plants that just went into flower two weeks ago. So these clones were taken two weeks ago and yesterday I went ahead and planted all these into one gallon pots. So they were in the dome for two weeks, 100% success rate, super healthy clones. I mean, there wasn't even one dead or yellow leaf on any of the clones in this dome, so really successful there. Green tags are all form cut Girl Scout cookies. The red tags, these four here, are Hell's Fire from Crockett Farms. Then we have three Sour Pebbles. I know, well, I don't know where the strain originated, but this is a cut from Fire Bros, Fire Bros 206, Fire Brothers in Seattle, just some growers. And then the last two over here are the True OG, and I don't think it's really True OG. I don't know what True OG is, but I'm assuming it at least grows like an OG, whereas this does not. Oh, and then also these four right here, which are Cookies and Cream 13. It's the Keeper Fino of Cookies and Cream from Exotic Genetics. So yeah, that's what's going on in the pre-veg. Oh, I also got our seedlings here still. Getting bigger. Remember, we've got 11 Mendo Breath crossed with Forum Cut Girl Scout cookies and then one Real OG Kush bag of seed. Also yesterday, came in and took clones for the next round because two weeks from now all these would be transplanted into five gallon pots and we'll need new clones to put in the one gallon pots for pre-veg. So what I decided to do is I'm really liking the monocrop idea, you know, hardly any strains to manage, so much easier to harvest. And I could well I could have done a monocrop of Golden Ticket or probably Fam OG or Casper OG, but I didn't I didn't want to do that. I decided to go with uh, two strains, so this next round is going to be two different strains. I took 60 clones of Forum Cut Girl Scout cookies, this bed here, or this tray here, plus half of this tray, and then I did 60 clones of Chem DD. <coughs> really liking the Chem Dog, the Chem DD that I grew a couple rounds ago, which just turned out awesome. I had a big mother plant of it. I purposely kept one out and didn't put it in the flower so I could take a bunch of clones off of it. And I took about 60 or 70 clones off of it. So that's this tray here and then half of that one. So this next round will be Forum Cut and Chem DD. Two totally different growth styles. The Chem DD gets a little bit taller than the tomato cages, kind of bushes out and really leafy, whereas the Forum Cut is just gonna grow straight up and be a, a stretchy, you know, stretchy typical cookie strain. So I'll have two different canopy heights in that grow, but it's a lot better than having many different canopy heights. And also they seem to feed about the same rate, so hopefully I'll be able to keep the whole garden green, unlike the gardens right now with all the different strains feeding at different, different, uh, different amounts of nutrients. And then lastly, I have one tray here with, uh, what is it, 10? 10, 10 Sunset Sherbert clones. So it's just another cookie strain. Um, I think there's like, some of you guys will know more about it than me, but there's, I think there's like two different sherberts. There's Sunset Sherbert and Rainbow Sherbert. And this is the Sunset Sherbert, so. Wanted to have it, my buddy had it, so I just went ahead and took some cuts off one of his plants, brought them over here, and then put them in the domes, or in the cubes and in the dome. 
So, and uh, next round I plan on doing, or this round with all these plants, probably do 10 lights worth of bay ground, 10 lights worth of animal cookies, and then I might do five lights worth of OGKB, and I might just do these one gallon pots and do nine plants per bed instead of four, just so the canopy actually fills out. Or, if these ones, which are two weeks behind, happen to catch up, I might throw some of those in the flower. Of course, I'd like to put these in, but based on what I'm seeing in the, from the animal crackers that's in flower right now, I don't know if that's a good idea to do. And we'll see that plant here soon. Okay, I'm gonna go uh, cut the video right here, change the white balance, then we'll look at the veg plant. All right, here we are looking down at all the veg plants. So these plants will go into flower in two weeks from now, and they're already pretty big. Uh, I could I could probably put them in the flower right now, and the canopy would fill out just fine. But it's just the way things go, uh, I don't have anywhere to put them, so they're just going to get continue to get bushier and bigger. We've got a bunch of lemon OG here. I go over this every week. I guess if you guys want to see what strains are in here, you can go back and watch last week's video. But we have a bunch of strains. I do want to comment on the OG KB and animal crackers. So here's the four animal crackers. And once again, they're shitty and flopping over and just sideways branch growth. Just, you know, they're not growing up. They just kind of grow up and then just flop over. See the one in the back there? So that really sucks. These will definitely not be going into flower. And then the OG KB, two of them are just garbage. I haven't touched them, I just wanted to see what's going on here, but two of them were really bad, and two of them were awesome. So, I don't know. Uh, I think I only had eight extra plants here, and I had a bunch of Aurora over here that I didn't want to flower, but I put them in as backup, and also the Alien Rift, I didn't want to flower those either. But, and I was hoping all the OGK being Animal Crackers would turn out to be something I want to flower, so that I can just run those and forget about the Alien Rift or the Aurora. But it looks like I'm gonna be growing both Aurora and Alien Rift because nothing here is gonna be worth putting in a flower. I do have some other plants that are about the same age as these that I just got from a buddy that I could throw in there, just some new strains and just test them out, but I think I'm gonna try and set up a small tester room instead to flower those in so I don't put them in one of my big rooms to start with. Here are four extra plants from last round. Had these gone into flower, they'd be at day 15 right now, but uh, they were extras, so they didn't go in. We originally had six. We have blue cookie berry crunch, or maybe cookie berry crunch from Riot Seeds, a uh, Casper OG, a Fam OG, a Golden Ticket, and then we had a Forum Cut Girl Scout Cookies and a Chem DD. Those last two plants got cut down into clones, which are just on the domes, and these ones are just sitting here chilling. Don't know if I'm going to kill them off or put them outside. Maybe it's a little too early to put them outside where I'm at. So, might just kill them off. They're just taking up space right now. I'll make that decision probably in the next few days. I mean, I'd like to put them outside because they turn into huge trees, but it's still a little too cold. So, they might just get killed. And then the next round, I might have some extras that I can throw outside. Okay, let's... Oh. And then here's some of the old animal crackers that are the same age as those plants that just aren't getting any better or any healthier. Maybe I'll keep those right and throw those outside. Trying to get those genetics to bounce back with the natural sunlight, be like no stress on them. And hopefully then they'll, they'll get better and I can take good clones off them. But we'll see. Okay, let's head up to flower room number two rather than one because right now the lights are on in flower number two so we'll just go into there and we'll hit up flower number one afterwards. All right, here we are in flower number two. I believe it's day 15 of flower in here. So just finished our second week. Today we came through and actually super cropped a lot of the plants. Really the only strain that needed it was the golden ticket and the Scots OG. The Scots OG is the far back bed back there by the dehumidifier. And then the golden, and that's just one bed of Scots OG. And then the golden ticket is not these first two beds, but all the ones behind it, and then two in that row over there. So, 10 beds. Four, eight, nine, ten. Golden ticket was definitely the stretchiest. Well, I guess Scots OG was right there with it. But you can see we super cropped.
and they're already starting to bend back up. All this. Probably tomorrow we'll go ahead and pull the trellis netting over everything. Probably tomorrow. Might wait till next week. But been feeding extra cow mag in here, so 1,500 milliliters, which is two milliliters per liter of Connoisseur A, Connoisseur B, Iguana Juice Bloom, Nirvana, Bud Factor X. I think they got Big Bud this last watering. Ancient Earth, Sensi Zyme. And then two milliliters per gallon, which is like 400 milliliters of um, amino treatment from House and Garden, and then 2,000 milliliters of cow mag. Remember, I usually do 1,500 milliliters of cow mag, but these plants were pretty light, so I went and bumped it up 500 milliliters, up to 2,000. I did that a few days ago in the watering, and they've really greened up since then. And then again today, another 2,000 milliliters of cow mag with 1,500 of everything else, so they'll continue to get green. And then, of course, I did 3,000 milliliters or three liters of Budswell bat guano, which comes out to be four milliliters per liter of Budswell bat guano. Uh, yeah, you can see these plants definitely healthy. Remember we have a bunch of different strains in here. I can go over really quickly. So this is the true OG, but it doesn't look OG to me. This is the Hell's Fire from Crockett. This is Wi-Fi OG, definitely a heavy feeder. My Wi-Fi OG in farm number one is very light green, like yellowing out. And you can see this one is still light in some places. But it's greening up. And then what was this one? Sour Pebbles? Yeah, Sour Pebbles. So that's this one bed. Then four beds of Golden Ticket. Four beds of Golden Ticket. And then this bed is all OGKB. You can see I, I pulled them all out of, under, outside the bottom ring of the tomato cage. See all this? Just kind of scrog them out. So I'm trying to get square foot jacanic in here, and obviously these are not filling out. If I had a, another one right there, or if I would have done nine, like I was talking about in pre-veg, then I could get a canopy to fill out on this, and I have enough to do it. So that's OGKB. Going over here, the back two beds are golden ticket. These two beds are cookie berry crunch from Riot Seeds. This bed is three Bay Grown Girl Scout cookies, that's the tall ones, and then one Animal Crackers. Remember I mentioned the Animal Crackers having flowers doing really shitty? That's it. This row, three beds of Cookie Berry Crunch. This is a Chem DD bed. Remember uh, when I was talking about the clones, I said this one just gets a little bit taller than the tomato cages and bushes out. Nice, bushy strain. Yeah, this, this would be perfect. If I did a monocrop of this, it would be so easy to manage. I mean, just imagine one solid canopy. This hasn't been super cropped or anything, and look how even this canopy is. These plants are just like all the same height. So that's one Chem DD. And this bed is four Forum Cut Girl Scout cookies. Last row, the back bed is Scott's OG. And then the front four beds are all animal cookies, except for one plant right here, which is a Cookies and Cream 13 from Exotic Genetics. Another thing I want to point out, it's just an observation. Remember I was doing some uh, defoliation uh, test here, just seeing if I wanted to defoliate. The one bed of uh, golden ticket that I cut all the leaves off of was this one right here. So that's that bed. 
And these plants have been super cropped. It was more obvious before they were super cropped. But these four plants that I took all the leaves off of, right, uh, right, right before we put them in flower, are much smaller and flimsier than all the other plants that did not have the leaves taken off. Look at the girth. Look at the girth of this branch here. See how fat that is? See how fat that is? See how fat that is? All of them. All the ones that weren't defoliated were, you can see how, how girthy they are. And then look at the biggest branches on the ones that all the leaves were taken off. Way skinnier, literally the diameter is like half the size. These branches are half as, as wide, half as thick as the branches on the ones that the leaves were not stripped off of. What does that tell us about yield? Nothing. These very well could yield much bigger than these still. The only thing, the only thing I know is different right now is that these have way skinnier branches and are a lot shorter and didn't fill out nearly as much. We've got like major hole in the canopy here where it's over here it's like pretty well filled in. Some holes and there's a couple plants in here that are as small as these, but generally speaking, out of the I guess what is it, 16, 20, 24, out of the 28 that the leaves were to strip off of, almost all of them are much bigger and thicker than the four that were stripped. So that doesn't mean they're gonna yield bigger. Just means that the bigger plants right now. Coming over to the form cuts, remember two of them I stripped down, two of them I didn't. Look at the ones that I didn't strip down. As much as 10 inches to a foot above the tomato cages, thick and bushy, wider from edge of plant to edge of plant than the ones I stripped. The ones I stripped, this is the top. Look at that, top of that plant compared to the top of that plant. And this one, here's the other top. And these are much narrower, much smaller square footage of canopy on these two than on those two. Another thing I want to talk about is biological warfare. You know, I'm trying to get away from all chemicals. I don't want to use any pesticides. For the most part, I really only use Avid. I mean, not Avid, Azimax. Remember, I used Avid and Floramite a couple times back when I had russet mites on the little clones. And after that, I've only sprayed with Azimax, which I do routinely. Probably once a week, I spray with Azimax just to be safe. But that doesn't do anything against the russet mites, so I went ahead and used Avid and Floramite back whenever, and that's when everybody got all pissed off at me for it. Even though I only sprayed them on little little clones. But uh, I went ahead and started researching predatory insects, and I told you before that I bought some predatory nematodes. I released those in Flower Room 1 several days ago. I don't know if it was before or after the last episode. But Flower Room number 1 had, had pretty bad root aphids, guys. I mean, I had winged root aphids flying around. And when I crawled them the one time, I'm like, man, I, I see a lot of these things on the, on the cocoa beds. And I, I bet a lot of the yellowing in there is from that. I've got another theory too, but at least some of the yellowing is probably from the root aphids. Let's just say that. We'll talk about the other theory when we go in there. So, obviously I didn't do any soil drench. In the past I'd use like uh, bear tree and shrub or bear fruit and citrus, but I only do that in veg. And that stuff actually concentrates in the, in the leaf tips and the flowers. So if you use that in flower, it, it's most concentrated in the buds. Like it's more concentrated in the buds than it is in any other part of the plant. So it's really not good to use. But I would only use it like in early veg. So if I'd get root aphids in flower, then I'd pretty, pretty much be fucked, but I never really did. But because I'm use, reusing these beds, if I get root aphids, I never swap the cocoa out. They just continue to thrive. So I went ahead and bought predatory nematodes 
and sprinkled some in there. This is the brand that I got. If you guys want to fight root aphids, you better write this down right now. Biologics Beneficial Nematodes. I bought this off of Amazon. I think I got eight of these packs. And it comes in vermiculite and you just, they come in the, you know, you gotta keep them refrigerated and then you just sprinkle them around on wet water and then water on top of it. But anyway, I'm telling you to write this down if, if you wanna control these, bio, biologicco.com because not more than two days after I sprinkled this, actually I didn't do it, one of my guys did, he sprinkled it in flower number one. I went in there, I saw like two root aphids. These nematodes wiped those root aphids out so successfully and aggressively. I'm not saying they're totally eradicated, they might be within the next couple days, but damn guys, huge difference after sprinkling this in there. I went from flying root aphids all over the place to literally crawling around and only seeing a couple every once in a while. So I ordered these and it seemed to work awesome. Speak of the devil, there's one on my finger right now, that little butt. Got it. Alright, we just went ahead and sprinkled these into this room last night. So I only see a couple around. They weren't really bad in here anyway, but I saw like some of them collecting like dead in places, so obviously they're worse than what I see. But uh, I'm hoping these nematodes kick ass in here. So before these came in the mail, I decided to order some more predatory insects for other types of pests, mainly spider mites. Now, I don't have spider mites, but I just want to play it safe and make sure I don't get any. So I called up this lady down in Oregon, Evergreen Grower Supply, and I had a good conversation with her. She was like the head entomologist in there, and I don't know if she was an entomologist, but she was like the head lady that's supposed to like know more than everyone else. She's like, oh, it's crazy, it's good that you called right now because I'm only in here like once every two weeks, so you get to talk to me. So I had a good conversation with her. I told her about the predatory nematodes because she wasn't sure about that, she didn't know anything about that, but I told her I'd let her know if they worked. But uh, just to be safe, if they didn't work, I went. she went ahead and sent me uh, these predatory mites, Stradio Lalaps, Simitus, and these are actually boring mites. They go down into your medium and they eat root aphids. So these actually got sprinkled in here last night too, along with the nematodes. Oh wait, the nematodes were two nights ago, and then these were this last night. And I don't know how they'll interact with each other. The nematodes, nematodes might kill all these mites. I don't know. These are really cheap anyway. So, and I know the nematodes were kicking ass, so even if these don't work, I don't care. Or if they get killed. So that's for another thing you can try out for root aphids or any other soil dwelling pest, or pests. And then she sent me two different types of predatory mites used for uh, spider mites. So I thought she, I don't know for sure what she, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. I, I thought she was gonna send me some predatory mites for russet and broad mites too, but I'm pretty sure both of these are for spider mites. So we have two different species of predatory mites here. And they're, they come on from in vermiculite. And you just go and sprinkle this around in your plants, I think. It doesn't say whether or not to do it during the day or night or what, but I haven't done it yet. I don't really have a need to because I don't have any mites, but I just kind of want to put them on there just to be safe. But uh, the first one is Neocelius phallicis. 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 Anyway, I don't know how to say it. I didn't take Latin. I believe these are the ones that are very aggressive. And you sprinkle them on there, they go around. So like if you have an actual infestation, like you're seeing mites around, you sprinkle these on there, they go through, they eat all the spider mites, and then they either eat themselves or they just die off. Like they come in, they destroy all the spider mites, and then they die off, okay? 
And then the second kind, Phytosalius persimilis. I want you to be able to read in case you want to look these up. These ones are not as aggressive. They go ahead and they eat spider mites, but not at, at, as fast as the rate as the other ones. And then once they eat all the spider mites, they kind of just chill, they'll eat pollen. I think they eat like mold spores and maybe some other things. They basically eat what they need to. And I don't know for that, I don't know if they eat mold spores for sure, but I think they just eat random shit. Anything they can find, they'll eat in order to stay alive. So they're much more resilient. They'll kind of hang out and then like if a spider mite tries to come in, these things will just like eat it up really fast before it has a chance to colonize. So if you have an outbreak, you don't want to use this. This is just like for preventive maintenance. So I'll probably sprinkle these, both of these on in here. And I don't know if they're gonna eat each other or what. I could fuck it all up, I put them on there together. But I think I'm gonna do like, maybe this one down one row of beds and then this one down the next and kind of alternate just to be safe, I don't know. But uh, I gave the lady my credit card information, she charged me, she sent it all up here. I had, I had no idea how much it was even costing, like I didn't even ask her how much it was. I was shocked when they showed up. They're so fucking cheap, guys. These are like 15 bucks a piece. I'm about to like call that lady and get on like a recurring, recurring order where like once a month she just sends me a bunch of this stuff. For 15 bucks, you could just sprinkle this on your plants right when they go into flower and literally not have to worry about spider mites. $15 a month, it's like a no brainer. So, that's a good idea. If you don't wanna to have to worry about spraying, I mean, you can put them in your bench plants for $15, I mean, come on. So easy, like, I would pay $15 to not have to put a damn backpack sprayer on, you know? So yeah, that makes it really easy. And then you have for root aphids. Don't know if these work, but I know these kick ass. But these are supposed to work too. These say, they say fungus gnats, thrips, and other soil pests. They don't specifically say wing root aphids, because I don't think, this, this lady didn't know exactly what species of root aphids they were, but I talked to a, a real entomologist and she's like, for the root aphids that, I told him like, yeah, root aphids, she's like, yeah, I know, I know what kind you have, and then she like blabbered off the species, and she's like, get yeah, predatory nematodes. So that's what I did, and that really worked. So yeah, uh, biological warfare, guys. Not having to spray your plants at all. And of course, the other big problem people have is powdery mildew. Get your environment under control and you won't have powdery mildew. Easy as that. I haven't had it in years. I haven't had it since my grow room sucked. Since I couldn't control the environment. If you can control your environment, you won't ever get powdery mildew. Okay, that's enough. This is a pretty, pretty long section in here. So one last look at the plants. Going into week three of flower. Oh, temperature's 80. 80 degrees, 57% humidity, I like that. Could be more humid, but you know, my room isn't dialed in enough to make it more humid at this point. So as these grow bigger and transpire more, it'll get more humid in here, so. Okay, we'll cut this part of the video. Head over to flower number one when the lights come on. All right guys, last part of the video. We're now in flower number one, where these plants are in there. Sixth week, seventh week, the seventh week of flower. Multi string garden once again, alien rift, all down here. One bed of Casper OG back there somewhere. Some Pennywise, some Aurora. The Goji OG last week I said it was really small. I crawled around here yesterday. Goji OG is going to produce big. <coughs> Probably well over 300 grams off the one plant. It's filling out now and it's just got tons of colas. Strawberry Fields, Crockett Confidential. What else is back there? It's a Scott's OG. Oh, four Scott's OG right here. Uh, that bed is ChemDD, looking awesome. A couple beds of Alien dog. Then back over there, mostly lemon OG, but then a couple beds of sour banana sherbet. Remember, I talked about that one plant that's really yellow. 
You can probably see it, I can't on my street. It's like right here, really yelled out. And I wasn't sure why. I was thinking maybe like Rudy if it's had something to do with it. No guys, my watering system is not watering evenly. When I crawled around yesterday, I went to that specific plant and lifted up the corner of the bed. The beds are well watered. It's, it's very heavy, it's probably like 40 pounds just to lift of, of weight that I have to lift just to get the wheel off the ground. That thing was bone dry. That bed was very dry. And that corner where that plant is specifically was really dry. So either I have a blocked water line or that part of the watering system is not getting as much pressure as the rest. So I'm gonna have to do something about that. But I, I wanna think the last round of a plant right there, right there somewhere also had the same problem as the lemon OG that yelled out really badly. But uh, it's still super frosty, it's still bulky and everything, just the leaves are really yellow, so it's been underwater, pretty well stressed. But, uh, oh, another thing is the lemon OG is closest to the dehumidifier. The coals aren't very big, they're not as big as lemon OGs typically get for me, whereas in the far back, they tend to, they're looking like they're a lot thicker. So just another observation I had. Yeah, about half the garden's still nice and green, the other half's yelled out. It's pretty much been like that the whole duration due to the different amount of nutrients the plants want. So, but uh, everything's stacked. It's gonna be probably a, oh, the Aurora and Pennywise might drag my yield down a little bit, but I'm gonna say it's gonna be like a three pound per light harvest. Definitely more than two and a half. The only thing that'll keep it from being three pound is the is probably the Pennywise and Aurora because they're not they don't have like big colas. Yeah, so probably two point seven five is my guess. Um, just before I came in here, I was killing time while the lights before the lights to come on, and I was just doing some touch-up trimming on the forum cut from the garden that was in here last time. Remember I had U-Dub right here in this bed, then Grapefruit Diesel, then Forum Cut, then a couple Dutch Treed, and then some Lemon OG, and then a bunch of Blue Dream. And about half that Blue Dream turned out to be Dutch Treed. So, what, I, what, what I'm getting at is, I'm just doing some touch or trimming on the Forum Cut. Probably got like an hour left to do on that. And then once I weigh that up, I'll have my final yield for this last round. Haven't done final harvest sales videos because I haven't gotten everything weighed up. But the round was in here last. All I have left to do is get that form cut weighed and then we'll do the final, final harvest results video for the grow that was in here last round. And I just want to say the U-Dub did not make two pounds per light. The Great for Diesel did not make two pounds per light. And the cookies, the form cookies, is not going to make two pounds per light either. But everything else in the garden is going to be well over that. I'm excited to share that with you guys because it was a really good, really good harvest, really good yield, good harvest. The round before that, uh, the golden ticket still isn't trimmed up, but all the random strains are long gone. Kind of at a standstill right now with the golden ticket. I need someone to come trim the rest of it. Basically have like four big 31 gallon totes of it left to trim. I just need to find someone to do it. It's tough. So uh, once that's done, I'll do the final harvest storage video for that grow too. Then the most recent harvest was the alien rift. Just today we got the last of it cut down. So no, it's no longer hanging. No alien rift is hanging anymore. And about 25% of it is still on the stems, but we basically just like cut the stems up and put them in the bins because they're starting to get too dry but the buds have not yet been cut off the stems, but the branches are in the bins. The other 75% of the Alien Rift grow is already uh, trimmed. It just needs to be weighed up. So that's looking like it's gonna be a good yield too. And we'll definitely do final harvest results videos for all these grows. I just gotta get the get the, all the trimming done and, and get uh, everything weighed up so I can actually talk about it. So. And this grow is going to be good too. And hopefully the next one is. But let's go ahead and cut the video here. 
I'm glad I was able to share everything with you guys this week. All in all, I mean, I'm happy with how things are going. Obviously, some of the plans are yelling out, but quality's still looking awesome and yields are looking great, so don't have much to complain about, really. All right, I'll see you guys next week in episode 35. Uh, maybe I'll get a final harvest results video up before that, but if not, see you then. Peace.